taking that time to get to know your nervous system, the patterns that your nervous system goes into, how quickly or what are the things that 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 take it into the place? What is your tolerance threshold, your window of tolerance that as soon as you cross that, it zaps into the freeze response. Freeze response is a very, very common one for trauma survivors. That's kind of where we get stuck and we don't quite know how to move out of it because when you're in freeze response, that's essentially what it is. You're frozen. You can't move. That is what it is. Your body, the cells in your body are in a frozen state and you almost need something external or some kind of intervention to get it to from a frozen state to a fluid state or a state of flow. And that's a gradual process. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. And today we have Ranisha Monoharan. Ranisha is a therapist and a coach supporting individuals recover from trauma using somatic embodiment, which is the practice of using of the body to access deep emotional seats within our mind. She is the founder of Radiant Roots, where she runs therapy, coaching, mindfulness, dance classes, and educational work for well-being. She works with individuals, groups, and organizations, raising awareness about the impact of stress, anxiety, and trauma on our well-being. Drawing from her lived experience, she also runs a special area of work supporting Asian women experiencing intergenerational trauma. Let's bring her on. Hi, Ranisha. How are you doing? How are you really feeling today? Hi, Madhya. It's really good to see you. I'm feeling good today. I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. Um, yeah, I am really looking forward to this and whatever comes out of it. I have no idea how it's going to go, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> how are you, Madhya? How yeah, are you today? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. I'm back in podcasting and just chilling and doing my thing. <laughs> so yeah. it's like I'm absolutely loving life right now. Um, so, you know, like, I was thinking back where we met. We actually met at a Love Attraction meeting in Manchester. We did. Yeah, we did, right? And you were explaining about polyvagal theory, which we're yeah. going to talk about in the podcast today. Um, yeah, and I just loved what you had to say, all the knowledge that you have. It was like, i got to get you on, on my podcast. And I went straight over to you. It's like, can you come on my podcast? And he was like divinely guided, right? You just need It was. Yeah, it really was. And thank you for that. That was a really nice, um, the in a nice way, the way we met each other. Uh, when I say night, it was quite an aligned, magical way, the way we came together, we decided to come to the same event on the same day. It was yeah. just um, quite yeah. perfectly aligned. Yeah, I'm really and pleased that we met. Yeah, same. So Ranisha, tell us about who you are. What do you do? A brief intro. Yeah, sure. So I'm Ranisha. I am the founder of Radiant Roots, which is an initiative towards inner well-being. And I've been running this for a number of years now. Through this initiative, um, I work with people in therapy. Um, you know, education is a very, very big part of my work because I believe education is power. It gives you the knowledge to understand more about yourself. So that's a very big um, branch of work in Radiant Roots. I also teach dance because mind-body alignment doesn't only happen in the mind, it also happens in the body. Embodied experience is a very big um, tool and, and practice to work towards our well-being. So I run therapy, education, dance classes, meditation classes. All of it happens under Radiant Roots well-being. And I started this initiative um, after about 10 years of going through my own journey when my journey reached its peak and there was almost nothing else I could do inside of my own bubble the next natural step was to actually start doing this through community through sharing through growing with other people um, and bringing a lot of what I had learned and my experiences to others so that's when I went on to um, to to learn and qualify and and run my work Oh, amazing. Amazing. So we, we're going to get into your journey in a bit. But uh, what sort of dances 
uh, is it like is it somatic dances or is it what kind of dances do you do well so what what kind of dances I do I do a lot of different dances I'm a trained classical Indian dancer and I've been doing that for about 27 years now um, but then through that I also went into Latin dancing I went into tango a lot of other western forms of dancing and every, every dance style has nurtured different inner elements inside of me what I'm currently teaching is classical Indian dances this is going to um, progress into other things which I have this this intuition about uh, but right now I'm teaching classical Indian dances here in Manchester so if you're in Manchester come join our classes it's, it's beautiful oh, amazing so you know you talk about the kind of body body te- keeps the score and you can release mm. that through your dance practice and mo- movement practice how does that kind of come about like how do yeah. you do How's that, that work dance? yeah yeah you know when Sometimes we can sit on a meditation mat and think and become aware of ourselves, right? That That is really, really so powerful when it happens on the meditation mat. But on the dance floor, it's an embodied experience. When you're on the dance floor, you start to notice if you have more energy in the upper body or the lower body. You start to notice if your right side is more precise or your left side is more precise. Is your left side... Um, slower or is your or is your right side slower which side do you are you more dominant on what needs working on different sides of the body different areas of the body are the hips tight is the torso able to isolate itself all of these have a, although they are physical in nature every part of our body has an emotional connection that connects us to that connects with the brain so you know, someone who struggles with anxiety and overthinking, what you might find is a lot of energy um, collects from the diaphragm and above. That even when you're dancing and you're you're grounding and you're doing a grounding movement, you'll find that your feet doesn't quite settle and go into the floor. Mm-hmm. It's kind of always ready to go into the next step, ready to go. You know, it's a slight uplift in that movement. And through dance, you can really very gently and compassionately and physically through an embodied experience start to ground and let go more into the feet, let go more into the thighs, into the, the calves or the, the ankles. And inside of that, you gain that very experience of letting go, of letting the other parts of your body take your weight, letting the floor take your weight, trusting that your thighs and your legs and your calves can do a lot more than, than we give it credit for, because that's how anxiety works. A lot of energy collects in the upper half of the body and the lower half is, isn't quite as um, active and as alive. Yeah, I don't know if grounded. that makes sense. Grounded. Yeah. 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 So if so you talked about if you had like one heavy, so if somebody had like a really heavy hip on the mm-hmm. right side, do you think that they also hold a trauma there as well that needs, can mm. dance really release trauma? So you know, we don't know uh, whether or not it is trauma, but it can very likely be trauma because everything starts from somewhere, right? Nothing, you know, I even believe that nothing exists in vacuum. Everything has an origin somewhere. And so a hip problem could potentially be something that is carried, something that is held. And movement, the thing with movement is it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's pendulating, so you're not sitting on, and you're not focusing only on the hip to get the hip to release. You're also moving other parts that support the hips to release, mm. right? To, to support all the other, all the supportive muscles are also um, activated. But the thing with dance is you're using music. So now you've got that additional element that zaps straight past the human logical rational brain. And when we hear music, all parts of us start to dance, whether we realize it or not. You know, some part of us, we just move. We almost go into a different zone where logic and rational doesn't doesn't play a role. And that lowers a lot of the pain um, threshold inside of us. And a lot gets healed through dance. I've seen 90-year-old men who cannot walk, and I'm not joking about this, I've actually seen um, a dancer who is, I think it was in his 80s or 90s, who could not walk on stage, but he could dance on stage as soon as the music wow, kicked on. Wow, really? Yes. Wow, that's how powerful it is. Yeah. 
Well, so yeah. we really need to get our body moving in in terms of music, get dancing dance. people, get dancing people. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, what do you say to like slow dancing? Because I, I absolutely love like when I am, you know, like when my body needs relaxing, I listen to the the gentle and the smooth, and then I move my body in like slow motion as well. Yeah. Um, does it like if you have anxiety and you need to kind of relax or if you feeling really overwhelmed does slow music really help with that like you know to bring slow yourself... music can help can really help slow down the brain waves because music works with the level of our brain waves too mm. also the other thing that could help is using um, music with deep beats deep rhythm you know that where the drums really create that that deep sensation Mm. That that really stra- goes straight past the the anxiety and the and the hyperactivation. So using something with steady rhythm, um, where the drums hit a chord that's kind of pretty deep, that could also be really useful. Rhythmic work. Um, wow, yeah, amazing. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. amazing! I was like, I gotta come to your classes. This, yeah, this is gonna go. I'll, this is gonna... I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dancing the night away. <laughs> yeah um so tell me about your childhood you know you we we touched upon what you do right um let's talk about your childhood what was your childhood like and your upbringing your environment yeah I'd say my childhood is the birthplace of where of this initiative really (laughs) (laughs) it usually is for everyone (laughs) it usually is absolutely (laughs) yeah um so I was born and brought up in Malaysia, in Southeast of Asia. And um, just to go back one step, I'm of Indian origins. My grandparents are from a combination of India and Africa, but Indian origins. And due to uh, partition and the various colonialization that was going on in India, they had to move to Malaysia. But not just them, also their relatives, a number of them had to move to Malaysia, a number of them were left behind in India. So there was a lot of separation that went on there. And then the generation after that, which was my parents' generation, they grew up in Malaysia. And and so I was brought up primarily by my mother's family. And which consists of um, eight adults in total, including grandparents. And you know how it is in Asian families, everybody grows up in extended Mm -hmm. settings. And I went to school in in a in a convent school. My friends were of multicultural backgrounds because of the location of Malaysia that is set perfectly between India and China, as well as close to Indonesia. The population of Malaysia was multicultural. We had the Malays, the Chinese, the Indians, who were the three major um, communities in Malaysia. Then we also have the Portuguese and many other uh, minor cultures in there. So I grew up in a pretty multicultural uh, country up until I was 19 years old. Now, Malaysia, as well as India, were pretty much countries that had just stepped out of colonialization. So people were pretty much in survival, whether they realized it or not was a different story, but pretty much everybody and all systems were built on survival systems. And we might talk about this a little bit more later, but so that meant that I grew up in settings that were survival oriented, Mm -hmm. which means, you know, it was it was largely about having to be tough to survive, having to um, reach certain achievements or tick certain check boxes in order that you can progress to the next level, whether it was at school or music class or whatever. Um, it was about being a certain way. And that was a huge challenge for me because everything that I needed to be, I was not. <laughs> Name anything and I was none of it. Right, I, this whole t- being tough to survive was a big one, and it showed up in so many different ways, whether it was in school or family settings or societal settings or cultural settings. It showed up everywhere, and I was not that because I don't know about you, but you know I'm quite a sensitive person. I absorb a whole lot, um, so having to fit into a lot of check boxes 
was something that I did because that's what you do, you know, if if that's, that's just what you do. But also um, a part of survival means having to fulfill check boxes. And that meant that I didn't fulfill check boxes that say that I was fair skinned or had straight hair or, you know, a lot of body oriented things were also came into play. So essentially what the child version of me learned was everything about me is wrong. My body is wrong. My size is wrong. My hair is wrong. The way I think is wrong because I'm not getting certain certain marks in school. Um, the way I, 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 I emote is wrong because I'm sensitive and I cry, you know, <laughs> shock horror, we cry. Yeah, yeah I, um, I understand that. Like in, in our yeah. cultures, like sensitivity isn't like, it's, it looks, it's like a flaw. Apparently, it's a flaw. It's a flaw. Mm. Yeah, That's, and this goes back to intergenerational trauma, which we'll talk about later, about how we, um, how that became a norm and a culture, even. Um, so most every most of what I was was pretty much wrong. Um, also was what I internalized as a child. So I grew up with, you know, massive insecurities. Um, overthinking anxiety was my norm that was my baseline that was actually <laughs> how I functioned through the world <laughs> yeah it's because you're yeah. not able to express <laughs> your 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 sensitivity it, yeah, yeah sensitivity was not even in the picture back then right? <laughs> that seemed yeah. like you know that anxiety was the norm even yeah. at the time so this just went on, went on. And of course, as you know, it accumulates and, you know, takes different shapes and forms, comes out in different areas of your life. Then I moved to the UK. Um, and coming to the UK, it's a very different culture, different way of orienting, different colors that are around me, which my body starts to, you know, clock. This happens at the level of our nervous systems. Um, so there was that level of anxiety. Also, I had no friends in the UK, you know, it, it, brand new in the UK. So all levels of anxiety began to develop and exacerbate and become and multiply. Um, and then I got a job with a multinational company, which was a male dominated job. Um, so again, that plays on anxiety levels. I was the only Asian and the only woman in that in that um, in that setting. Um, so all of this, well, what I can see now is all of this built up and really, really exacerbated as a way to get my attention. If I look at it from that perspective, really. But they came to a point about, I think about 10, to, between 10 to 12 years ago, when this really hit a very massive point. There was almost, uh, there was no way I could live with it any longer. It was just so strong. Uh, and this happened when I moved from a full-time job to a part-time job. I moved to a part-time job in order to research dance, basically, to do some dance research. When you move to part-time, from full-time to part-time, you have half that time taken away now. So you've got half, you're working half the time, the other half of your time, you're free. And when there is free space, traumas that, that are very underground start to emerge. That was not part of the plan, but they emerge and they start to, to show up. And I experienced things that I couldn't quite put my finger on. It didn't make sense. Equally, I didn't feel like I could tell anyone about it because I couldn't make sense of it. And I didn't, you know, when I look at the environment around me, no one else seemed to be experiencing anything like this. So I took matters into my own hands. I remember Googling uh, meditation center near me and, and one came up mm -hmm. and I attended that it was a Tuesday evening that I attended I think I googled it on a Sunday and Tuesday evening I attended it and that was um, the I, th I attended the event and we did two meditations that day I struggled through both meditations but that night was the first night I slept so beautifully in a long time and and that's when my journey started, really. I started to study myself, studied my brain, study my mind, study my body. Sorry, the body hadn't come into place yet at this time. It was just my mind because to me, it was all in my mind and, and was my, my own mental health struggle. Mm -hmm. So I really took this very, very seriously. I was going for retreats, you know, studying for many, many hours a day, practicing many hours a day. Um, it was a full-on commitment apart from my part-time job at the time. And then came a point where I um, I understood so much about my mind 
But yet, when I went into certain um, triggering situations, what I realized was all that self-awareness was just going out of the window. I was still experiencing huge level of triggers. My heart rate was still going up. I was still feeling really frightened in certain settings. And I thought, this is weird because I spent so many hours investing. Why am I still experiencing things so strongly? Mm -hmm. That's when I came to understand that half the story is actually in the body, that the body is holding imprints and memories, implicit memories, not explicit. They are implicit memories of trauma and emotional charges that were just sitting there. So that's when I went on to recover at the level of the body. And then I went on to qualify and certify and learn how to support myself as well as others. And that's how I came about to where I am today. So really. that's your journey um, yeah. that led you to feel the work that you're doing yeah. today. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So let's talk about polyvagal theory. Right. Yeah. So we yeah. uh, that's obviously this is my exciting subject yeah. with you. <laughs> so we came across, like, can you come on my podcast and talk yeah. about this? Yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about it. So what is it? What is yeah. freeze, flight, uh, fight response? Yeah. Yeah. So polyvagal theory was coined by Dr. Stephen Porges. And and then it was um it was brought into a therapeutic context by Deb Dana. This is as per my understanding. So polyvagal theory offers a neurophysiological framework to understand why we act the way we do. So I'm going to start by going straight into an example, because I can tell you the theory, but the example is going to really be something that you might, uh, our listeners might relate to. So say, let's just give someone a name, say, Sandra, for example, wakes up in the morning. She's feeling good. She's feeling safe, connected. And children are happy. She is happy. She's playing, giving them a bath and all of this. At this point, Sandra's nervous system is in what's known as the ventral vagal state. So this is one of the states of the, ner of the nervous system. This is when we feel safe. We feel connected. We are happy emotionally. Mentally, we are not consumed. We're just kind of feeling good. And um, we, have, we have perspective, insight, clarity. There's rational thinking and there's, um, there's uh, logical thinking. Everything is working great. Um, we also feel socially engaged with others. So she will be very easily be able to engage with her children, attend to her, their needs as well as hers. So that's the ventral vagal phase. But then let's say, say, I don't know, an ambulance passes by and the siren goes off. And then what Sandra might find is that her heart rate starts to go up. She starts to feel agitated. She starts to feel irritated that this is here. Um, you know, maybe her body starts to tense. There's muscle tension in certain ways. This is a sign that her nervous system has gone into the sympathetic branch, which is also known as the fight or flight branch. So this is where our nervous system um, picks up cues from the environment. So an ambulance, the sound of the ambulance passing by, obviously that's you know intended to get our attention and clearly it does. So the nervous system picks up that there is something here which it picks up as danger or something to pay attention to. So that raises the heart rate, that raises the body's temperature, it, uh, it leads to muscle tension in the body and you know different people would tense up in different parts of the body depending on our history. And that information is communicated up to the brain. And the brain starts to create interpretations of that, of that nervous system experience. So what the brain might interpret is, this is really irritating. I wish this would go away. Hurry up and pass, please. Um, or, or that agitation may even come out on children. The, why would you not just get ready quickly? Uh, hurry up. I have to go to work. What's actually happening in the, the nervous system is, her nervous system has gone from safe and connected to fight or flight, also known as the sympathetic branch. And inside of the sympathetic branch, we start to look at the world through the lens of, of survival, i.e. through the lens of threat. What here is threatening my peace and calm and my survival? Which can come out, and this, this can come out on the ambulance itself, or it can come out on children, or it can come out on ourselves. So why can't I just be able to do X, Y, and Z? Yeah, so that's one of the branches of the nervous system. And then say the ambulance passes and, and it's not a very long ordeal. 
And then she feels safe and connected again. She's able to play with her children again. So this is when the nervous system switches back into ventral vagal, or what is also known as the rest and digest or safe and, connect, safe and connected zone. And then say, you know, she goes to work or she was from home, whatever it is, and emails start to flood in. Now, Sandra has grown up in an environment that is quite authoritative in nature. Her nervous system may have already been shaped to um, to um, um, to respond to authoritative figures in a certain way. So, if say she grew up in an environment where teachers say is the last say, or parents say is the last say, or societal says is the last say. And whatever they say is the absolute truth. And as a child, she had to um, fulfill their demands in every way possible. That is an imprint that she would possibly carry into her work life as well. And when you get an email, you have to tend to it ASAP. When you get a request from someone, tend to it ASAP. So this comes from the imprints from the nervous system that says, if anyone in authority or higher up above me or anyone related to my survival, i.e. because jobs are related to our survival, our employment is, that then affects the way she responds to email, how she responds to presentations, or how she responds to requests or, you know, um, meetings inside of that. And say she's got, you know, today happens to be a day where she's just got so many of them coming in. Her nervous system now, from safe and connected, starts to... Um, either go into fight or flight because now the level of uh, request is coming, not just the level of request, but how she is responding towards her requests, what her nervous system understands that she must do when requests come. That starts to accumulate. And if it's too much, the body then goes into shutdown mode because this is simply too much to bear. So the nervous system might go from safe and engaged to fight or flight. And that's where she might feel agitated towards the emails that are coming in. You know, she might feel like, oh, I just want to hit the pillow <laughs> or I just want to uh, crash something. <laughs> that's part of the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. But if it's too much, she might go into shutdown mode. And that's where we start to feel, oh, this is all quite pointless. I'm just feeling completely helpless. Um, I'm not good enough for this job or this job isn't for me because this is when disconnection happens. Mm. So when the body goes into the freeze um, state, also known as the dorsal vagal state, this is when we start to experience a, a shutdown in a physiological level. So the torso starts to collapse, our eyes start to get droopy, our breathing starts to become shallow. Um, we start to notice lifelessness, you know, in our hands. They're not as active and able to do things anymore. There's a, a lifelessness or a numbness in our bodies, our hands, our legs. And the body experiences it in that way. So that's happening at the level of the nervous system. By the time this reaches the brain, the brain might interpret this as I'm not good enough or I'm, or this job is not good enough for me or I can't really move from here, but yet I can't, I don't really want to be in front of the screen. It's that state, it's the turtle in the shell mode where you're completely um, feeling helpless and powerless towards the situation. Mm. And what polyvagal theory tells us is it's not you, it's your nervous system going into certain states. And when we understand and know how to see what states our nervous system is in, we develop autonomy to help our nervous system move back and forth between states. Does that kind of um, yeah, make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the freeze response, like personally for me, freeze response is really, that hits home with me because yeah. I've been that most of my life, you know, through anxiety and depression. But I feel like even recently, I'm. you can be a very functioning yeah being in that <laughs> trauma response what is going on yeah <laughs> right? yeah so it's like yeah. it's like um so I went to London so like we went for this podcasting show right and yeah. I went completely went into freeze but at the same time I'm going there and I'm fist bumping Gabby Logan right yeah. and I'm just wow. but, yeah I know and I'm frozen <laughs> how am I doing that and I'm feeling sick all the butterflies but yeah. it wasn't that I went to the to see her because I'm not I'm not I don't really get, tend to go into that it was uh, 
travel, traveling on my own. The first time mm. I'm traveling on my own, first time I'm staying in a hotel mm. and completely go into freeze response where people are asking me to do something and I'm like trying to, it's like it comes across you're lazy, but you're not, mm. you're, your yes. nervous system. Yeah, exactly. Is trying to self-regulate yes. and trying to, it's like at that moment when I'm really nervous, I freeze and people expect me to do the certain things. Mm. And I'm like, like completely like, yeah. like brain fog, like can't, can't move myself properly. And it just comes across and it's like, oh, stop being lazy. Stop. I'm not like, I didn't realize yeah. this. I didn't realize this until when I went to London and um, I wanted to freeze response. And then it made sense that I'm actually in freeze response a lot of the time. A mm. lot of the time because I'm functioning. I'm like, there's a part of me is like really, really out there, motivationally mm. speaking, and all of that mm. stuff. And it's like I thrive in it. But there is yeah. also that just before I go into state, I freeze. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I go into, into that response. So yeah. what are what are your thoughts on that? Like you know, people kind of um, misunderstand it as being lazy or being oh, not that yeah. people or a lot of people say I'm lazy but it's like mm. it's it can come across that you're not willing to do stuff in yeah. that moment yeah so there are a few just a few things that I picked up here um do you know one thing is that we are very very used to overriding our body's cues we are so used to it. Our bodies may actually want to curl up and feel safe and regulated, but we are conditioned and wired in so many ways to override that and function anyway. So it means that you probably are still going to deliver whatever you need to deliver, but there'll be a conflicting state. So your body is saying one thing, but you will have that power to override it and just deliver it yeah. because this is what we do. And that's probably what has happened that your body may want, have wanted to feel safe or regulated or had some kind of nourishment in some way. Um, but you will have been used to just functioning despite all of that. And that's what you were functioning out of. If you were functioning from a place of having had the many, many experience of doing it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. but that creates a mind-body disconnect where you're no longer functioning from a place inside of you that is fully connected you're functioning from a different branch that is the branch of you that is so used to doing things so used to delivering already do you see what I mean mm, I see it I see it yeah and I think yeah. it's like um the freeze it's really fascinating because the before um like I got into public speaking and after my spiritual awakening before then it was just very much complete freeze like it yeah. was very to a point where it was paralyzing me like yeah. I used to suffer from se severe anxiety mm -hmm. to a point I could not even leave the house right so that freeze was so strong that I couldn't even get out of bed yeah. for days and it was it was trauma and I you know and we, we talk about you know we, we we're talking about like light things like the ambulance going past and the over stress and overwork and what about trauma how much does that impact um <laughs> yeah like there you go. how much how do you how do you deal with that when you have so much yeah. deep trauma there yeah so that's absolutely a trauma response when you can't and your body has accumulated so much that even stepping out of the house is a task and a half mm. because the body has has just collected that much stuff that it just cannot collect anymore. And even stepping out of the house is a huge task. Mm. And it sounds to me that perhaps that a lot of that has 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 worked. You've worked through a lot of that. You know, it sounds to me, and that's really amazing. So wonderful and. Amazing. I'm, I'm happy for yeah, you. Yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a journey. Yeah. And and so working through it is is not a it's not a six week journey and it's not a, a retreat journey. Mm -hmm. It's a lifelong journey. Because trauma takes a long time to develop. 
And so we also need to give it that time to recover. In my opinion, I feel the recovery rate is a lot quicker than the than the time it took to um, to develop. Mm-hmm. That's what I've I'm I'm sort of sensing into. Um, but taking that time to get to know your nervous system, the patterns that your nervous system goes into, how quickly or what are the things that that, that take it into the place. What is your tolerance threshold, your window of tolerance, that as soon as you cross that, it zaps into the freeze response. Freeze response is a very, very common one for trauma survivors. That's kind of where we get stuck and we don't quite know how to move out of it because when you're in freeze response, that's essentially what it is. You're frozen. You can't move. That is what it is. Your body, the cells in your body are in a frozen state and you almost need something external or some kind of intervention to get it to from a frozen state to a fluid state or a state of flow and that's a gradual process to go through mm. oh 100 mm. i think it is it's like you said it is a lifelong journey um yeah. like we always you know there are certain people who are you know they they're they're they got a lot of stuff that they they want to deal with and they can't because they're still in that freeze response and every time they go into their body's like shuts mm-hmm. down and your body's actually doing the work is like it's actually protecting you right yeah ultimately absolutely. it's protection from pain you know yeah every there, right absolutely it's, yeah that's the part thing with trauma is that we would do anything and everything in the world to not have to feel the pain mm. that we are in we yeah. would just do everything in the world to not have to feel that because yeah. it is painful. Yeah. But but I feel like on this journey that I've been on so many people, um, like releasing those emotions really help yeah. um, your body to kind of recognize it's okay to process this pain. Yes. Yes. Right. That's a big one. So emotional release is a very big part of, of recovering and tra- healing from trauma. Mm-hmm. The other thing is also completing cycles that were incomplete. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. So, for example, if you were young and you were bullied, and when I say bully, it can be physical bully, but it can also be emotional or verbal bully or non-verbal bully. Is also, it's also the same impact that it creates in the body. And your body learned that if I were to fight this person, I'd be in a much worse place. So the body will have, you know, immediately just shut down instead of fighting the other person. What's actually happening in the body is the body will have gone from safe and connection to first it would go to fight or flight. If fight or flight is unavailable, it flops into freeze or shut down mode. Mm. Now, the reason you shut down is because you your nervous system will have worked out there is no point in me fighting this person and I cannot run away from the situation. It's called the flee response. So it flops into shut down mode. But before it went into shut down, there is the fight and flight could have been available, but it was it was not in this situation, perhaps. And completing the cycle really is about going back to the other responses that your nervous system could not access, which it might have wanted to access. So maybe it wanted to push the person away and tell them to, you know, go away, you know, go away from me. That's part of the fight response, which the nervous system didn't get to do. Mm-hmm. And part of trauma recovery is offering the nervous system that capacity, that embodied experience, so that those cycles can complain. And then what happens in the future is you come across someone who perhaps has similar demeanor, you know, has that nature in them. Now, because your nervous system has now learned that a different response is possible, that you don't need to shut down, you can actually tell someone to go away, you will automatically start to assess in this situation, do I need to shut down or can I tell this person to go away? Mm. Where before trauma worked, you might have just shut down. That might have been the only option that you would have gone to because that's what, that's the only option that your body knows. Mm -hmm. But as you walk through trauma recovery with the body, you teach your body different responses. And in those moments when somebody comes to you and, and violates you in some way or crosses your boundary in some way, your body knows that it has different experiences, different options that it can take. So it doesn't have to be all mental level work. Your body will have had some experience of different options that it will then 
tell you. Mm, that makes sense. For... That makes it. It's, it's a bit like going into a relationship that's abusive, and then your body will know if you're in the yeah. next one, right? But then yeah. again, you can't sometimes. What? Yeah. What? How? Do, yeah. <laughs> it's a mystery yeah. to me. Okay. That, that's trauma bonding right there. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of stepping back, you know, a lot of developing your own sense of self mm. to be able to sell, step back, and evaluate. Mm. 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 So there's a recently I've come across fawning trauma mm. response, right? We mm. know about these three big main ones, yeah. uh, but I didn't realize there's a fourth one, which yeah. is fawning trauma response. And I didn't realize it was there um, until I interviewed an uh, amazing woman like Annalie Howlin, and she was talking mm. about it. Um, yeah. And it made me, it really... Um, I'm going to be really like vulnerable here. It really, yeah. really sent me down a bit of a uh, little, little bit of a dark patch yeah. because I realized I phoned most of my life Yeah. after that yeah. interview. And yeah. it was a lot of, so you, you're going to, you, I'll, I'll tell you about it, but you're going to, you know, what, yeah. what is your take on it? Um, yeah. What is phoning and yeah. how can people overcome it? Yeah. It's, very common it's very common it's part of the nervous system blended state so you've got to fight flight and freeze but when nervous system states start to become so it's not as clear cut and fight flight and freeze because it's it's more intricate than that when we start to go into blended states of one or more we 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 come across the phone response i'm going to share with you an example that dr stephen porges um put across in one of the karama conferences and it's going to shed a positive light to it because I know it's it's a hard one to hear. But what he's uh, one of his talks, what he brought up was an example of um, women in abusive relationships who stayed in abusive relationships, and there is an intelligence in their nervous systems where they detect, where the nervous system knows there is a threat. But in service of survival and ensuring that they're okay, their nervous system also knows how to activate the social engagement system so that they are in connection with the abuser. And this is to in so that they are safe. Again, all of this is involuntary. It's not a choice that anybody makes. It is involuntary and happens at the level of the nervous system. So the nervous system now understands there is a threat in place. The nervous system understands that the only way I'm going to stay safe in this connection is if I activate my social engagement system, which is the ventral vagal system, which is the you know where I'm safe and connected, where I fake my safety and my sense of connection. So I stay connected to my abuser so that I will not be abused, so that I bring down their attack or their defense by staying connected to them. At the same time, I also know my the nervous system also knows that it is under threat. So it does this to, to bring down the levels of attack or defense in the abuser by activating the safety and connected and connection um, branch of the nervous system. And it, and think about how highly intelligent the nervous system is to be able to activate two different states in order to ensure that person's survival. Think about how intelligent that is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, the reason I said, you know, I, I said that because I was in an emotionally abusive relationship, right? Mm. So I was fawning quite a lot. So after that interview, she when she was explaining what phone response is people pleasing and they could say the most like horrible things and you still put it brush it aside because yeah. that like you said that level of connection and that level of you you're just going into that resp trauma response you know mm -hmm. and you're just playing along with it you're playing yeah. along with the abuse you're playing along with mistreatment yeah and yeah, so it's 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 that one is really difficult to spot because that could also go down um, down under uh, chronic people pleasing. Mm. So I'm gonna um, speak from the perspective of the nervous system here and what could have happened there. See, we are we are social creatures. Relationships are everything to us. 
mm-hmm. and especially intimate relationships. It is a big deal to us, mm-hmm. and especially us as adults. You know, us as adults, colored women even more so. Especially if we're living in a country where others around us are not of the same color. So all of this information is collected by the nervous system, and it then, it then um, um, calculates the importance of sustaining intimate relationships because it's so essential to survival. Mm. And when it is that essential, the nervous system will almost always choose attachment over authenticity. These are always the two options that we have. Are we going to choose authenticity or are we going to choose attachment? And then the nervous system already has, you know, traumas from who knows when, and you're inside of an intimate relationship, of course, it's going to choose attachment over your authenticity. So your authentic part will say, okay, there is mistreatment here. I'm not feeling good about this. You know, I, I feel disrespected or I feel unheard or I don't feel affection, whatever it is that different people feel. But that gets overridden because you, by overriding that, you still sustain connection. You still sustain attachment. Hmm. And even that part of your nervous system that wants to sustain that connection will have activated um, gestures and intonations and body language that says, I'm in connection with you no matter what you say to me. Hmm. And that's part of the nervous system's way of saying, of choosing attachment over authenticity. Mm. What happens is when we step out of relationships, we have that space to question both branches, the branch, what our authentic branch was telling us and what attachment branch was telling us. But in those moments, it's almost always attachment wins. So how do you break that cycle? How do you what do you do with the freeze flight yeah. fight fawn? yeah what do you do how do you i mean it's always going to be that because it's, 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 it's in our nervous system right you know it's yeah. it, it's survival but how can you come to a state where it doesn't affect your everyday life or yeah or go into or tolerate abusive yeah. relationships yeah so what happens with individuals who experience trauma is that we can get stuck in one of those states and not be able to move back into the safe state which is the ventral vagal state also known as the safe and connection zone what happens with um individuals who've not experienced so much trauma is that they can move between states more fluidly and and easily Mm-hmm. But with trauma survivors, we get stuck in one state or another and we can't quite move back to the state that we want to be in where we can see things more clearly. And one of the major work that we do in trauma work is to, to work through those stuck states so that you have more capacity to easily move between states. So you're not in a fawn response and stuck in there and unable to get yourself out of it. But rather you can move from that state or acknowledge when you're in that state and resource yourself with enough of tools, enough of education, understanding, awareness, enough of resources is a big one there to move to a different state that might, and a different state might actually give you a different perspective, the perspective that you have when you're in fawn state or free state or whatever state it is that you're in. Mm -hmm. Resourcing is a big deal. Also which of course that. I can't talk in 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 one conversation but just to know that resourcing yourself with different tools different awareness educating continuously accessing um support and 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 work working relationships which which resource your trauma responses mm, like goes a far way. way like have you heard Absolutely. of internal family system I'm yeah sure you have. yeah it's yeah. a great therapy to go into it's a great um, one yeah so you but once you have the resources you can dive into doing the work um and regulate it so you know how to regulate your nervous system yeah absolutely. Um, so let's talk about intergenerational trauma oh okay yes right in, uh, <laughs> yeah. asian heritage so yeah. yeah you tell me um yeah you, you work with asian yeah. women Yeah, so a subspecialty of my work is in intergenerational trauma from an Asian heritage. I work with a broad range of people and in working on Asian trauma, 
traumatic symptoms with Asian women is a sub is a subsection of it. Um, what I have experienced in myself and what I see is stems across many, many Asian women, many, many Asian women. Now, a lot of us go through our lives feeling insecure. We experience self-doubt to the degree that is so intense and, and profound. Um, we make excuses for inexcusable um, actions. Um, we feel guilt-tripped a lot of the time. Our sense of self and our sense of worth is at a down low. And a lot of us experience this. That when someone in authority comes and appears to know what they may be saying, we immediately assume that they are right and we are wrong. So we completely invalidate our own choices, our own voice um, in favor of someone who we see as an, a figure of authority. Um, we also experience a level of anxiety, restlessness, and we also experience a lot of overthinking of what is known in the world as overthinking, but actually it's just a, it's a highly active brain, a very, very highly active brain, which is doing what it does because of certain missing pieces in our lives. And we also experience a great deal of intense loneliness, which is masked by our hyper-perfectionism. It, it's masked by our achieving one thing after another. But inside of us, there is an intense level of loneliness. We feel things very deeply, whether we express that or not, it's a different story. But we feel the grief, not just of our own grief, but a lot of us also unconsciously feel the griefs of others before our generation. That And griefs that have not been felt, but we have in some way or another inherited it. There are many, many things that Asian uh, women of this generation, what I call the third generation, if we see the first generation as those who were part of partition and colonialism, that, sec that the third generation and the fourth generation then suffer a lot with. And a lot of these sufferings and traumatic imprints are subtle. They are not obvious like, um, like, like, um, like experiencing, um, poverty in a in in a in a in an obvious way or famine in an obvious way. A lot of our traumas are very subtle and they play out in the way we feel. That's how we get to know what is going on and how we've inherited this. So if I go back to say the first generation, those of us that our our grandparents and great grandparents generation who um who experienced partition and colonialization in all different ways. What happened in that generation was there was before partition and before colonialization, there was a safe space for everybody. There was a deep sense of community that everybody lived in, that our grandparents and great grandparents lived in. People were not dependent nor independent. They were healthily interdependent on one another. They were healthily interdependent on their society, the community, the village leaders they were also healthily interdependent on earth resources around them. That's how they source their food, their water, their livelihoods, their lifestyle. So this interdependency was massively ruptured when partition happened, colonialization happened, and a lot of individuals had to flee their country or not just flee their country, some had to go travel far abroad some travel Africa, some travel to different parts of Asia, some travel to the UK, um, and some travel to other states in the country. So they would have lost not just their uh, interdependency on, on Earth, uh, but also their interdependency on one another, on their society, on their social structures, all of which were their safe spaces. They also lost their interdependency on their very own land. You know, what was the home, the land on which you slept on, that was lost very, very quickly. And this sends the nervous system immediately into fight or flight. If that was available for some of us, we may have flopped straight into shutdown mode. But for most individuals in that generation, their nervous system would have gone into sympathetic, which is the fight or flight response. And I'm not just talking about one person going into that state. 
I'm talking about the entire nation going into that state. So that was now the collective normal. Fight or flight was the collective normal. When we are in fight or flight, a lot of things happen. We live our lives in restlessness. We live our lives waiting for the next shoe to drop. We live our lives through the lens of threat and survival. We live our lives looking at people and, and life and the world through the lens of suspicion. We also lose the capacity to articulate and have emotional connection because a certain parts of the brain that are responsible for connection and safety is completely shut down when we are in fight or flight. That now goes down the generation to, to the next generation, which would have been the second generation. Now, these were the generations that now did not have their homeland to grow in. They were now in foreign land. Whether the foreign land was in India or, or what is now Pakistan itself, or whether foreign land was a completely different country. In my situation, it was in Malaysia. And they grow up in um, homes that were overcrowded. So there would be three to four families living in one home. And each family didn't only have one or two child, each family would have six, seven, eight children. Overcrowded homes became a big thing then for the next generation. That means enmeshment, where everybody's sense of self was highly dependent on one another. And that means very few had a healthy sense of personal worth. That means that every person within one family would either be dysregulated towards a nervous system that was predominantly in fight or flight or predominantly in shutdown mode. And you would see between siblings that one would be highly volatile and active and had high level of tantrum, while the next sibling would be quite cool and quite um, quiet and, and non-confrontational. And then the next one would be, again, quite volatile. You'd see these patterns among siblings itself. Mm -hmm. So siblings were pretty dysregulated. And again, they, were, they lived in survival. Their lives were enmeshed amongst one another. Everybody's survival highly tightly coupled with one another that if one person was no longer part of the picture say there was a bereavement or say there was an illness or say that one person chose to go off somewhere else it would highly affect the tribe itself mm. and because of enmeshment a lot of asian families experience what we call as drama but i call it trauma because mm. drama is essentially trauma Mm -hmm. hiding itself as highly highly charged interactions and this existed a lot in Asian families and they were not small level dramas or traumas they were large levels you know they were, it was pretty intense for many many Asian families that so much of various levels of of trauma that that shows up in the form of abuse became normal mm. punishment became normal this was also in societal systems and school system the the um the uh what do you call it the um the trend of punishment became a very normal thing that when it came to the third and fourth generation we are now inheriting levels of trauma from multiple generations before of us we are inheriting the trauma of many generations before of us so at least two generations before of us being stuck in survival and we now assume that survival is the way to go. Survival is the norm. Except so many in our generation have started to develop emotional sensitivity. And that is not accounted for, mm -hmm. when, for by, by the generation before us. So mm -hmm. here we are experiencing all this sensitivity and empathetic ways and sympathetic ways. But there is no context to it. We are experiencing it. But the world around us says, no, that's not the way to go. So we, of course, push that aside, except it is our reality. It is there in our bodies. The sensitivities are there. And we grow up experiencing chronic anxiety, chronic overthinking, chronic stress levels, high cortisols that are constantly running through our systems, cortisol levels that are not just ours, but also inherited from the generations above us. And wow. then that shows up in our bodies as whatever it is. Wow. And it goes far and wide. It goes far and wide. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm. Oh, my God. Light bulb. <laughs> yeah, light bulb moment. 
yeah yeah I oh my god you just blew me away because everything that you've just said there is like how I see like my culture and family and it's like very tight-knit very much if one expands somewhere else it's like that's like it causes a lot of drama um and drama is like why are you expanding why are you going this way like you you know and overcrowded as well like because we're so tight-knit you they live in like their cousins of the extended families they just come and stay in the same house same place uh live together and it's it's really interesting because and also what you've pointed out with about the new generation that's coming through they can they kind of feel like the black sheep of the family or or the culture right (laughs) because they're completely different to what their 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 parents or their grandparents are teaching them so how do you how do you what do you do with that so if say for example I'm that person who is that black sheep of the family and I'm healing that generational trauma and I'm doing something completely different to what my culture is teaching me yeah what do I do with that well the first thing is to accept that you are breaking cycles and it's going to be very uncomfortable (laughs) oh man yeah It's so uncomfortable. I'm totally with you on this. It's so uncomfortable and painful. You're not grieving your own pain now. You're grieving the pain of so many people, right? You're grieving also the loss of your own sense of autonomy, Mm. all of which which was snatched away, you know, just like that. Autonomy and personal agency that we couldn't grow up with. Who am I? Am I valid? Is my color valid? (laughs) Is my body shape valid? Is my skin color valid? Is my way of thinking valid? Most of which which we will have learned were invalid. Mm -hmm. So much of it. And the the first step is actually fully accepting that being a black sheep can be a wonderful thing too. Because when we heal, we're not just healing ourselves. We are healing and many others of our many of our ancestors, all of which also sit in our biofield, all of which sit sit in our genes. So you giving yourself a voice, you're also giving your ancestors a voice. It's just not obvious. Mm-hmm. It's very subtle, it's unspoken. But our ancestors sit in our bodies, our ancestors sit in our genes, you know, it sits in our skin. And when we give ourselves a voice, we give them a voice too. When we grieve our pain, we grieve their pain. And sometimes we even need to go into that space. And this is part of our inner work where we start to see, you know, this thing that I'm suffering, is it actually mine? Or is it somebody else's somewhere up the line? Mm. Becoming very clear what's mine and what's not mine. And that is personal work to do as well. Wow. And how, how long does it take? For it, well, it's going to be lifetime, isn't it? Because you're working with so many different generations. Wow. It's humbling. It's humbling. It really is. It's very humbling because you start to become connected to roots you never thought you had. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like I was, I, I always often saw ancestors as people who lived and, and lived in a certain way and passed down certain things. But actually, ancestors are also within us. And ancestry isn't, all traumatic we also inherit ancestral blessings ancestral mm-hmm. goodness ancestral resilience that's mm-hmm. also there and that's that's a field to tap into mm-hmm. and where you were saying you know how do you do this um it's not so much a question of how much time it takes it's a question of depth how do you, are we willing to go um and, and also the courage to go that deep developing the courage to go that deep and I would like to add to this space here that it's not as frightening as we think. It's actually quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's actually a very beautiful process. Um, so not to be afraid to go into that because what you'll find is underneath all of trauma are very basic needs. The need to be loved, the need to be seen, the need to be held, the need to be acknowledged and the need for connection and belonging. These are all the basic needs on top of which all different complex traumas exist. 
underneath all of them, these are the beautiful needs that we all have. And mm-hmm. these are the needs that we tend to. Mm-hmm. It's quite interesting you just said that because I just got, um, I was on a, somebody just interviewed me like a couple of weeks ago and I was telling him about my, like, because I'm doing completely different to what my family and the culture is yes. doing, right? So it's been a battle, but like a, being a massive battle, <laughs> like, yes. you know, maneuvering through that. Yeah. But it's like when I was there in that, in, in the environment or the, that yeah in that environment I said exactly the same thing I didn't feel loved I didn't feel heard I didn't feel seen I felt like I wasn't enough if there was something more I need to do and it's yeah so I I feel the breaking being that black sheep like you said it's also a gift because what you you're doing you're doing something that is remarkable because you're breaking that generational yeah. trauma and yeah. also you're giving way for the next generation to come in and then they they could carry it on so it's like could absolutely. you imagine like if they carry on the work that we're doing right absolutely yeah can you imagine if they carry on the work that you're doing and when you do the work and go into all these dimensions into yourself get to know them, grieve what needs to be grieved and resolve what needs to be resolved and take action. That's a big one, taking action. What I've come to realize is it doesn't just stop with you. And we know this, right? It doesn't stop with you. And it doesn't stop with the next generation alone. Your life starts to change Mm. massively, Mm. massive, massively. The kind of energy, um, bodies that you start to release the kind of tightness and constrictions and and unhelpful patterns that you start to release transform your life and that means everybody around you starts to feel the ripple effects of it Mm -hmm. for some it's a pleasant ripple effect for some it's an unpleasant ripple effect but nevertheless it's the ripple effect of healing Mm -hmm. and that and that goes across you know your colleagues start to feel it your friends start to feel it. Things start to slip away and things start to come come together. Magnetism starts to change. Mm, absolutely. It's powerful. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And that, that's it's if you're in this situation, I'm talking about uh listeners, then carry on the work, carry on. You're doing an amazing job because it's you are. Yeah. It's, yeah, and it's don't really underestimate. Mm-hmm. And I want to say also to listeners, you know, it might seem that what you're doing is small or subtle or um or you know it it doesn't have a very big impact but it has a profound impact Mm -hmm. a very big impact and a beautiful one that you're doing not just for yourself for yourself you're also doing it for the younger version of you that couldn't experience certain things Mm -hmm. you're doing things for other sisters and brothers who are like you Mm. so and, and it goes far Oh, beautiful, beautiful, really beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, so now you work with people, you know, all you said you, you work with board board range board range <laughs> with broad. people, broad, broad, board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Um, so what type of role do you play? So you've recognized they have generational trauma or you recognize a certain trauma or you recognize the the fight, flight, freeze. So what sort of role do you play with yeah. them? Yeah. So I'm a therapist and a coach. I'm also a meditation teacher, apart from dancing, which we dance teacher, which we talked about earlier. That is my primary lo- my, my primary role as a therapist, coach, and educator, because I'm a big fan of education. Um, and when people come to me, not everybody comes to me with the knowledge of trauma. Some people come with anxiety. Some people come with relationship challenges. Some people come with, um, you know, feeling like the way they think and the way they feel is so completely off the charts. They just simply don't know how to make sense of it. Some come with workplace stress. Mm. So I get a whole, you know, wide array of things. Some people come with grief of loss of some thing that they've lost maybe it's a relationship maybe it's a bereavement 
So different people come with different things. And some people do come directly because they already know their the childhood trauma and that then develops into intergenerational trauma understanding. So I work with a whole wide array of people. And um, we don't always go straight into trauma. Often in the first few sessions, it's about developing safeness. A big part of trauma and a big part of mental health challenge is that we simply do not feel safe in ourselves. We don't feel like it's okay to be in our bodies. We don't feel like we are okay the way we are. We don't feel okay with the way we're thinking, that our thinking is a challenge, it's a problem, our bodies are a problem, we are a problem in some way or another. So resourcing yourself so that you feel safe in yourself, connected to yourself, is a big part of some of the first few sessions that we, that we go through. Resourcing, big one. And resourcing includes practices. It includes that therapeutic relationship because therapeutic relationship can sometimes offer you what you have not experienced in other relationships. It might be the missing piece. Uh, so that in itself is um, it's a big factor. Mm -hmm. So we learn practices um, and we also cover education because it's important that people understand what is happening to them is autonomic. It's automatic. It's involuntary. Mm -hmm. And when we understand things are involuntary, we start to develop personal agency. That That's where we start to grow our own selves of sense of personal agency. And then, you know, if someone comes with intergenerational trauma, we also look at family history, um, how our nervous systems are shaped the way they are, what are the nervous systems around us, how those nervous systems have shaped the way they are. Um, and then how two different nervous systems correspond with one another. So learning to recognize recognize that we also look at how to shift states of nervous systems um, we also look at expanding the way we think because we only think the way we know how to think we may not have explored different ways of thinking different perspectives so how do you start to incorporate different ways of thinking mm. that associate with a specific state of nervous systems we also look at releasing anything that is emotionally held in different parts of the body as tension patterns. Sometimes we may, you know, have a chronic sense of, of tightness in our solar plexus or tightness in our chest. Maybe our shoulders constrict in a certain way around certain people. Uh, maybe our breath changes amongst uh, around certain people or when we're doing certain things. Maybe we tend to get fever around certain people or nauseated around certain people. These are all signs that there is an emotional charge, there is something unresolved, or maybe many things unresolved, and we look at working through things bit by bit. We also look at completing any cycles that were incomplete. Um, so, you know, if your body had to go and shut down for whatever reason, could your body access other possibilities too? It's a whole wide range of things really that we can look at. And it's such a beautiful and deep journey. Mm. Beautiful Amazing. and deep journey that so we can is, go through. I guess this is the work you do. It's like you got to be that black sheep in order to do that work to yeah. help others as well, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's beautiful, really, really beautiful what you what you do and the role that you play with them. It's like it's, yeah. it's really I important. Have really important i have to say this is the most beautiful journey i have ever taken in my life <laughs> hard i mean i'm not gonna stay right it's hard yeah, yeah. but but coming through it myself and working with people it's it's a beautiful journey um in that it connects us with so much that is real and true that we've ignored so much of our lives oh beautiful yeah i agree i agree mm -hmm. Wow, <laughs> I don't, I don't want this interview to end, but unfortunately, we, have yeah, to, we could go uh, on. Oh, yeah, no, cool. we could go on for hours. Um, yeah. Before, like, we wrap this up, I want to ask you rapid fire questions. I, you know, okay. I, all my guests go through this, so you okay. can't. There's no yeah. escaping the, the okay. grill of yes. the questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. Are you ready? Right. Hang on. Let me get my my body into state. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of God, universe, 
life? Um, it's energy that's inside of us and all around us. It's an intelligence. Beautiful. What do you think happens when you die? I change form and part of me becomes earth <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and warm food and other part of me merges with something else. Beautiful. Is, yeah. yeah. You get a choice. Like, what do you want to be now? I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can choose a la carte menus. <laughs> Or you can do the gambling in, in the other realm. It's like, okay, oh, yeah. I'm gonna play that lucky seven. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, I'm going to be a rock for this lifetime. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> amazing um how do you define religion and spirituality um i feel that religion could be the stepping stone towards spirituality it mm -hmm. could be it could not be but it could also be and when we embrace all religions and see all of them we start to see the connecting dots and then that's perhaps maybe when we start to step into the spiritual zone beautiful um What's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Okay, I need a minute. This cannot be as rapid. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, this one. Love matters. Mm. Love matters. I think a long time from my life, even after I started my healing journey, unconsciously, I had believed that material things matter it was so deeply ingrained inside of my system that's where intergenerational comes that I often chose material comfort over the need to feel loved and to just simply feel alive and I chose this in ways that really cost me mm. wow love Beautiful. matters people love matters oh yeah that's another topic what we can talk about next mm -hmm. time get you on the podcast yeah um Do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best futures? Yes, I do. Mm. If if we if it depends on what the choices that people make throughout their lives, but if we choose to and think about Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. think about think about Gandhi and all these people who have made such big changes in the world, you know Vincent Van Gogh and the kind of art he creates, they're all born out of suffering. Victor Frankl, you know, so much born out of suffering. 100%. 100%. Mm. I'm fully in present moment when? <clears throat> I am fully in present moment when I am feeling loved and I'm in love. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of just one past that generation trauma when you're like, I'm feeling loved today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. I was just sitting there the other day. It's like, there's nobody around, but I love myself. <laughs> <laughs> how amazing is that? It's such and an how amazing many, feeling. And how many people before generations could have said that? Oh. That's another question. And and then you see those ancestors and all everybody else like in the past like cheering you on you yes you go bro <laughs> <laughs> absolutely totally I oh, love it I love it um do you believe that there's an end to healing no I feel it's so infinite because healing means grow and I don't think there is an end to growth and expansion and evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mm. the world needs more of what I know what the world needs less of but what <laughs> <laughs> the world oh the world needs more of slowing down oh slowing down 100 time oh I agree I so agree. much can happen right It's so happen. much can happen when you do nothing yeah really Absolutely. really the less is more <laughs> less is more less is more yeah um so what is that one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity spiritual awakening dark night of the soul and can't see the light at the end, end of the tunnel yeah. what is that one message would you give them yeah 
for anyone who is inside of this place, what I would say is you are inside of a tunnel vision and not to give up because tunnel vision is not everything that there is. Outside of you, there is a whole world that exists and it's okay if this is where you are right now. But just know that there is more beyond this tunnel and not to be afraid. If you're inside of it, big things will happen and you will step out of it. Oh, beautiful. Oh, my God. That's, mm. oh, that's such a great message. Such a great message. Wow. Okay. Um, how can people contact you? <clears throat> yeah, so um, you can visit my website. It's called Radiant Roots. So that's Radiant Roots with a hyphen in between, radiantroots.co.uk. Or if you do a Google search for Radiant Roots Wellbeing, you'll find it. My Instagram is radiant.roots.wellbeing. And so that's both my Instagram and Facebook. And um, you can also drop me an email if you're listening to this and you have something to contribute or something to contradict. I often want to hear because I only know my perspective. And if, you, if there's anything you'd like to add to the conversation or anything that hit home for you, I'd love to hear from you. It's connect at radiant-roots.co.uk. And I would love to hear from you. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you, Ronisha. That's uh, it was such an amazing interview. And I'm, I really enjoyed it. Uh, mm-hmm. it was, yeah, I think like so many, our listen- so many of our listeners will relate to this. And I want to say, Madhya, that a big thank you to you for creating this platform that so many people are able to access so many different subjects. I mean, you cover amazing range of subjects and also the depth that which it goes to. It's incredible. So big thanks to you for oh, what you do, you. the work that you do. It's amazing. Thank you, Anisha. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Maria. Huge thank you to you. Take good care. Thank you for listening to this episode. I would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. You can share your thoughts on my Facebook or Instagram, Madia Sosen. If you would like to listen to this episode, I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.